All right, so uh, we're here in Seattle with the Carter Johnson Leather Library around us, which is pretty cool, or at least a portion of it. And we're going to just have a conversation about some stuff that I think is important, and uh, I'm excited to get to know you a little bit better. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So high level, I want to start with something that I think is important. The ability to self-identify is really important to me. Humans are really complex and we live a really rich lives and we have a lot of personal histories that are kind of unique to us. And so before we get into the interview, I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about your identities. And I want to be clear, I'm using the plural of that word, right? Um, I'm not just interested in like gender identity and sexual identity and, you know, whatever. Identities are, are we have many identities. Yeah. So how do you identify And what pronouns do you use? Uh, I identify as a leather dyke. I'm also an emotional support animal. And my pronouns are she, her. I'm a cis female. Do you identify in in any other ways in parts of your life? I'm an Apache. I am of the Denai Nation to the colonized that's Navajo. I identify as a boot black. I'm a service bottom. I'm a submissive. Yeah, I think that's about all of them that I could think of. Sometimes it's hard to like stop and think about all of the different ways we identify, right? Yeah, there's there's a lot. There's so many different aspects to people in their lives. I know you grew up in Colorado, which has been turning more progressive in recent years, but, you know, more historically was kind of with the flyover states a bit, kind of got a bit lumped over uh, into a lot of those. Um, I'm curious about you know, uh, your growing up years, growing up in Colorado, what was it like to kind of live there, to grow up there? You know, and I know you went to school there too. So what was that like? What was, what was growing up like? I, I was born into, you know, a family with a brother, an older brother. When I was about six, my parents split and my mother met my stepfather and he was with us until he passed. So years with my, my father, I don't have a whole lot of memory of family mm. with him. I have memory of, of dad in a, a divorce sort of state. So, you know, visitations on the weekends and, you know, weekend trips to, for us, it would be Elitch's, the, the amusement park. I, of course, have a lot of memories with my stepdad, my other dad. He was an awesome person. He came into our lives. And at first there was struggles because you know he there was a, an issue with alcohol but about the time that I left home I was 15 mm. I I was emancipated and kind of started to find my own way in life and try to still maintain relationships with my my parents you know I have a an older brother and a younger sister from my my second dad. And I remember being in Boulder, and, and this is a thought about my, my indigenous heritage. It wasn't something really that we had celebrated before I left home. Uh, my mom went to CU Boulder, and I remember being, I was very young, elementary school. And I remember they the school had asked us about our heritage, our lineage, and I knew that we were Native American, and I had indicated that on something, or I had I had verbalized that. I don't remember, but somehow I indicated to them that we were Native. And then after that, the thing that sticks out is my mother it really bothered her. We started getting mail, kind of inviting us to Indigenous sort of spaces mm. or programs or you know other outlets for indigenous contact and it really upset her so having a a native heritage was not something that we had celebrated and it it became a little confusing for me because as I mentioned I was I was kind of young and it just created a a bit of a a disconnect for me I guess as far as school I I made it to my senior year but then I I tested out so I, I graduated, but I didn't actually stay in school to graduate. Mm-hmm. And then I, I went on to an art college for a couple of years. And when I ran out of money, I, I had to stop going to school. And I guess it was in the late 90s. I wandered into a, a local 
Gay and Lesbian Community Center, and there was a discussion group on women for women in a dungeon kind of a thought, hmm. and it, it kind of intrigued me. So, you know, I, I wandered in, and it was two other two other folks there, and we ended up at the local bar having snacks and, and just talking. And had you been out at that point about being gay, about being a dyke? Yes. Okay, so that was... I came out in high school. I, let me rephrase that thought. I came out to myself in high school. Mm. I was a sophomore, but in my junior high and elementary school time, my dad, my stepdad, he was a roofer. So we moved so much because his job was seasonal. So we had to move a lot. So by the time I made it to high school, we had moved around enough in the elementary and junior highs. High school for me was all of those in one spot. So I knew most folks there and having that knowledge, having that social, that wide social of folks, I would see how my heterosexual friends would speak about my gay friends. Mm. And this was, you know, late nine, I'm sorry, late eighties. So right around the AIDS epidemic and throughout my high school career, of course, I, I, started identifying more and more openly with with who I was and and attending parties with more and more dominantly gay folks attending and there was the scare of yeah of, of the AIDS issue in in my my time so that that was a a weird situation to like be going through and and such a young age i i remember one of the male cheerleaders they called them yell leaders i was at a party and he kept trying to kiss a female cheerleader like really kiss her not you know brother sister kind of a thought and a a month or two after that it was discovered that that he was positive Mm. and that was it was such a a strange time to be to be because it's like was he really trying to to infect another person because you know he has it and he's angry so high school was, was kind of a trip for me well, and, and at the time, right, like so much was unknown about HIV. Yeah. <laughs> because Reagan, right? Yeah. But it, yeah, it must have been pretty scary, like coming to that knowledge about yourself in that time period. It, it was. Yes, it was. And being so young, right? To- and like when you're young, it's easy to make assumptions and it's easy to like operate on on faulty information and faulty data and the lack of information yeah just kind of strikes me yeah like of course now I know that that an attempt at, at you know kissing saliva wouldn't you know that that wouldn't be a way that he would be able to do that but it it truly did create a situation not not just for me as a, as a, a homosexual but for for others because there was the the gay bashing that that was also becoming more and more and and more extreme as far as the the beatings if you will sure so yeah growing growing up well I should say my high school years and my coming out years uh being the same time frame it it was it yeah it was confusing because we were also then very cliquish because again this is high school so having folks kind of go off together and and all be gay but still all be kind of separated and and choosing those divisions of who we are and who we group with you mentioned gay bashing being in Colorado like you're not that far away from Laramie mm-hmm. and you're kind of talking about late 80s into the 90s yeah. and of course it was 92 I think was Matthew Shepard yeah I don't remember the year but yeah I remember that was that something that kind of shot through the community in in Denver or, or in the area mm-hmm. at the time I was coupled with with a, a woman who had a, a young child the the young one was two when I met mm. when I moved in with the mom and with them. And as a family, we attended a local MCC in Denver. And I remember being in, in the service that Sunday and, and the child was, you know, in the back room with, with the other Sunday school folks. And I remember the church being really packed that day. 
like a lot more than usual. And just that whole sinking, like sad, like it was such a, they killed that man because he was gay. That man, that child, he was a boy, Mm -hmm. you know, he was so young and to understand the level of, of anger and hatred and fear that those, those two who perpetrated that crime, well, those two who physically perpetrated that, that crime, it, it was, it was an overwhelming sort of situation and having a, a family to protect at the time really created like a lot of, of concern and hmm. seeing the church show full and, and yeah, just the rise of, of gay bashing that, that was, it, cause it, it was, it was really bad in Denver for, I'd say, you know, a good number of years, you know, there was the, oh, what they call them, the, the, an angel group started, guardian angels, I think actually, but they were gay folks who, who would, you know, they all wore, you know, the similar jacket and they walked around the, the Capitol Hill area, the downtown area mm-hmm. of Denver. And that's, you know, of course, where the, a lot of the gay bars were and, and they would walk around just to make sure that, that folks weren't being harassed simply for their orienta- mm-hmm. their perceived in orientation. I, I think it, it kind of definitely put a, a hesitation in me as far as other folks, you know, going out and being and, and trying to feel comfortable. Because sure, when you're in the bar, you're probably fine because there's a lot of other folks of a similar mind. But when you go outside, who's to say that somebody isn't going to follow you or somebody's not outside waiting or... Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it kind of puts you on, well, for me, I should, it kind of put me on a more of a defensive sort of state of mind. Sure. That's, I mean, it's understandable. Mm-hmm. So you live in California now. Yeah. How did you kind of make your way to California? I had been partnered with my submissive. I, she had lived in Sacramento and moved to Colorado Springs, which is about an hour south of where I lived. And by circumstance, I met the dominant that she lived in the house. She lived in the house with the dominant and the dominant's submissive friends. And I happened to meet the dominant. So through that connection with the dominant, she also mentioned that her roommate didn't have a whole lot of friends and not a whole lot of social. So I, I was, I happened to be doing something like the next night, the dominant was doing something in town and they were bringing the roommate and the roommate was going to kind of be on their own. So I, I, you know, I invited them along and eventually we of course coupled and, and moved in and we had a, an open relationship and turned out that her mother, who lived in Sacramento, was caring for her grandparents, who lived across the street. And the grandfather kept falling. And so the, the girlfriend wanted to move back home to, you know, help mom. And because I had been uh, riding, I don't know, at this time, maybe five years motorcycle, living in Colorado, that it really cut the riding season short due to the snow, the ice, and then after all that was gone, we still had to wait for them to come and sweep up all the sand because the gravel on the, you know, the gravel, of course, would make traction on the ice. But once it melted, the streets were all gravelly. So when she, when, when the, the ex wanted to come back and, you know, we talked about it and she's telling me how Sacramento and the weather and we're only an hour from the ocean, we're only an hour from Tahoe where it snows And the riding season. So I'm like, heck yeah. You know, so I I actually, I came out here because I I could ride my bike. I didn't Mm -hmm. have a car when I lived in Colorado. So I figured moving out here and not having a car would be even better because I wouldn't have to worry about the snow. Sure. (laughs) So I I moved out here with her and that that relationship lasted for for a few more years. What, What kind of motorcycle do you ride? I, I have two. I, I recently, I guess about a year and a half, two years ago, I, I got a Moto Guzzi. This beautiful white and gold, sorry, white and chrome uh, Italian motorcycle. It's a 2005 California. And the bike that I've had the longest, and my favorite, 
is this Honda Shadow Ace. Mm. Me and that bike are like fluid. I love <laughs> that bike. I, I used to ride a little bit, yeah. and I owned a Honda Shadow. Yeah, 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 oh. yeah. My Shadow. I when I moved out here, that's the bike I brought with me. We threw it in a U-Haul, mm. and we're driving. And and my ex's mom was driving the U-Haul. My ex didn't drive cars, so I was driving the car. And we had a walkie-talkie between the vehicles. And the mom had turned off hers. She's pulling into the gas station in the rental truck that has my bike, and. The awning and the truck, and she's not paying oh, attention. No. And I'm on the thing. The horn on the car's not working, and I'm freaking out. Oh, no. Because that's, that's my – she has my motorcycle. And I think that's what saved it is the weight of the bike had dropped mm. the, the truck enough that she maybe <laughs> cleared it with an inch. And she gets out all la, la, la. And I am just livid. Oh, I'm, I'm trying not to, you know, go scream and yell. And, but, yeah, that was my trip out here with my bike. Wow. There's a, a number of leather houses that have kind of sprung up in the, the past few years. And you're a member of one of these houses, the House of Iron. Can you tell me a little bit about the House of Iron and how you got involved and how they got started? Our house matriarch is is Miss J. Iron. And I am, of course, I'm on Facebook. I have a friend, Jane. And Jane started a number of... Uh, Butch Appetit, Femme Appetit, Bong Appetit, all these Facebook cooking sort of for gay and lesbian and, and trans and two-spirit, you know, for folks of like mind. And in these, as these groups, as the number of groups grew, Jane, of course, started to need help and she asked if I would moderate. So I started moderating, I, I think I still do, like four or five of these groups wow. for Jane. And they're fun. They're awesome. They're it, it's fun to see, you know, what folks are cooking. And this one participant always posts what he does for his mom. You know, he, he's anyway, I love that guy because he's taking the time and he's putting in the effort and he's you could tell the love. Mm. And it's it, so I enjoyed these groups. And as the groups grew, of course, the moderators grew. And Jane, at some point, I don't remember when, brought in Miss J. And we, we had never, Miss J and I had never had any direct contact with one another. So I'm assuming being in this moderator group with her that I caught her attention. It's the only thing I could think of. And one day I'm, I'm at home on Facebook and, you know, I'm on my couch petting my dog and I get this DM from her, from Miss J and I, I like to equate it to the Kool-Aid man kicking down the wall. Miss J came at me with with a huge energy and and a massive sort of I don't know, it was it was it was overwhelming. Miss J is, is quite an energy. So we started that that basically started our, our conversations was through the through the Facebook. And in our time together, of course we d- discovered that we're both indigenous. I don't know if she knew I was, but I found out she was. And that's actually when when my leather and my indigenous came together. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I of course, have, have always been indigenous and I've always known that, but it was not something that we had celebrated in my youth. After I was out of my mother's home, I'd say 18, 19, my mother started discovering or, or looking for her, her heritage, and I was already out of the house by that time, so it, that didn't that didn't have the same effect on me as it did with my younger sister. She still lived at home. But when Miss J came into my world, it was a, a lot of energy and a lot of indigenous that, that I was not aware of, and Miss J would, would share indigenous with me, and as our uh, DS relationship developed the protocols that Miss J put in place for me to help me with with things like my social anxiety and and you know various other um, challenges that I I faced I remember the most beneficial every morning I would get up I would shower I would cleanse my my space with sage I would you know the smoke I would spend a moment in outside 
just appreciating the moment. I would be in the moment. That was like a huge one in the moment. And I would set my intention for the day. And every morning I did that. And as that practice continued, I started recognizing the benefits and my attitude and how if a situation would present itself where I had a knee-jerk reaction to it, I was aware enough of that knee-jerk and also understand that my reaction doesn't give me the right to to blah at someone. So in my in my practices, I would stop and think, whoa, okay, wait a minute, stop. Be here in the moment and understand this person. And that would allow me to stop and, and breathe for a moment and release that sort of initial reaction and then be able to speak with somebody. So having Miss J remind me about my ancestors and remind me about who we as a people are and that anger isn't part of who we are. Mm. So just that whole time and, and effort and focus that, that Miss J brought to my space was you know, life-changing and I'm forever grateful for it. So as our, our DS grew, Miss J had been working with uh, with another person, a co-founder. So the two matriarchs were starting to, you know, bounce the idea of an indigenous house. And as that sort of, that seed sort of grew, Miss J started bringing in indigenous people that, that she had connection with. And through that, the conversations that, that the group of us started having and kind of defining that, yeah, we want a direction, that, yeah, we want a family. So individually, Ms. J started announcing to us that they've created House of Iron, and I believe I got my email, not my email, my my messenger in May asking me to be a part of her house to to be a part of her dream and, and, you know, come and work with her and and others and uh, see if we can, you know, make a difference. And then the, the focus of decolonizing kink started, you know, being passed around and, you know, kind of what that looks like and the efforts that we can individually do to start, chiseling away at, at that sort of thought and we we just you know the conversations just continued and we as a, a whole just kind of started growing and I believe the original group of us I think it was like eight or so and I'm not quite sure where what number we're at today but I know it's a bit larger <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool to see like a need kind of get filled right and like there are a lot of people who have that heritage who have kind of been living in leather community alone. And I know like for me as a, as a trans person, right? Like I look around and I don't see a lot of people like me mm-hmm. and, and so that experience can be really lonely. And so yeah. there's a real need for like a community for people who are, are kind of minorities in minorities. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And yeah. it's been cool to see the, the conversations that are springing up and being, kind of kicked off and facilitated by a house of iron and, and, and others. But, you know, it's, it's cool to see those topics kind of being brought to the forefront a little bit. Yeah. Both of us are boot blacks. And for those listening who don't know what the word boot blacking is, it's an older word to refer to the practice of leather care and, and shoe shining. When you see a, a shoe shine at the airport, that's boot blacking, right? You know, my, my understanding is that that word kind of goes back to using lamp black, uh, which was a it's like a byproduct of burning oil in lamps. And that yeah. was used as a pigment. Right. Uh, both of us, as of earlier this year, have held community awarded titles in the leather community. So congratulations on your win as a Northwest Boot Black this year. Thank you. I judged Northwest uh, a number of years ago, and I know that 
that title positions itself as a education title. Mm. And I hold a firm belief that the best teachers never stop learning. So I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about how you kind of came into boot blacking, how you learned how to boot black. Sure. When I was back home in Colorado and I mentioned I, I wandered into that community center shortly after that sort of growth started for me, I I met a woman named Linda. She was a Marine. Well, she is a Marine. She's still living. <laughs> and Linda kind of took a shine to me, I guess. <laughs> Didn't mean it that way. <laughs> That's funny. But anyway, Sir kind of mentored me in, in BDSM because I, I was squeaky clean vanilla. And, I, I, you know, of course, I didn't know a whole lot. And Sir kind of mentored me in a number of ways. And in our DS, I eventually became her collared submissive. And my my social anxiety and, and my uh, shyness, like I used to blush, like, oh, my God, I was, I was brutal. Even my ears would burn. I, I would <laughs> have such a blush. I, Not to confuse the two, but I think... My win at Northwest, I burned my blush out. Hmm. I, I was red for, for hours. But anyway, so with Sir, uh, she she's a Marine. And in an attempt to help me deal with the whole shy, quiet wallflower, not really utilizing my voice, not having that power of my voice, Sir sat me down and taught me how to boot black. First, I, of course, did her leathers and learning from a Marine was, you know, a high enough of a standard that, I mean, it wasn't intimidating, but it was a good enough goal in standards that it pushed me to achieve what it was that that she produced. You know, I, I wanted to duplicate that sort of, because it made her proud of me. And my childhood, that was never really something proud or happy with you or you know, those sorts of, sorts of thoughts were not often. Uh, like growing up, I think I remember hearing my mother tell me she loved me before I moved out, I think one time, you know, and I left at 15. And that's a long time to be a child and not hear your parent tell you you love them. Hmm. My dad all the time. My dad's awesome. But my mom, it, you know, I, I very much wanted that validation. So when, when Sir came along and... I recognized that the the happy and the proud that I I would get from her when I did a good job on her boots, it of course made me happy. And in my progression of of growth, the Sir started having me work the local stand at the at the time it was the Triangle Bar uh, in Denver. So. The group that I wandered into at the community center eventually became called Collar, Colorado Leather Ladies Alternative Resource. And they would hold beer busts. And I would go work the stand at the beer bust. How I was able to do that, I had the focus in front of me of a pair of shoes. I have to speak with this one person. I don't have to worry about all these folks behind me. And... I knew that this one person, this one conversation, this one moment would be limited to the time it took me to take care of their shoes mm. or their leather. So I felt confident enough to take care of the leather. I was okay enough to have a small little chit chat. And I was safe enough that it was only going to be 15 or 20 minutes of, of this. And if I needed to take a minute after you know, I could go get me a Shirley Temple <laughs> and have a quiet moment and then go back. And then from that, the progression was at the beer bus. I would then, uh, in Colorado, we would be able to go serve everyone who had bought a cup. So we would walk, the hosting club would walk around with pitchers. And again, it's a limited, I have to pour a beer. I have to say, hello, thanks for coming and move along. So Sir is the one who actually put me on my path. 
I can't count the number of boot blacks that are socially anxious <laughs> and learned to boot black to give them something to do at an event. <laughs> I'm the same way. I, I know many, many people who have that story. It's, yeah. it's kind of funny that we share that experience, I, so many people. I hear it a lot, too. <laughs> What's the most recent thing about boot blacking that you've learned? Actually, just recently... It was just a conversation. I, I can't remember where I was, but I was somewhere talking with or sitting near some folks who were talking about boot blacking and the question of, oh, I heard the boot black say, have you been to Burning Man? And I've heard that before. I know there's something about Burning Man and I know there's something about leather. And I know if somebody with Burning Man, you don't want to touch any other of your your kit with if you do someone with Burning Man, whatever you used in your kit is is now garbage. You don't ever use whatever on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what like what was the issue with Burning Man. And I I've recently found out that actually my sash mom Moxie that that is one of her specialties mm -hmm. is, is she focuses on restoration from Burning Man sort of issues. But I think it's the soil is what it, what I heard. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. The, okay, okay, cool. The yeah. silt on the playa is very basic, and that it can eat it at leather okay. and degrade it over time. And if you if you get it in your brushes, it's going to get everywhere. Yeah. And it's going to just transfer from, from brush to boot to brush to boot to brush to boot. And so you have to you have to do something to neutralize it. And usually it's vinegar and water in acidic, right? The the acid and vinegar to to neutralize the base of the the playa. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I I just I just asked that question I think what four or five days ago. So yeah, I, I so, totally believe that, you know, as a boot black, no, I'm I'm not all knowing, all seeing. I, I still have a lot to learn, and I'm I'm still really happy when people take the time to educate me. Yeah, so. I, I love that about boot blacks. I, I think, you know, most boot blacks are always learning some new little trick or some new little product or, you know, some, some tip that somebody just taught them. Yeah. As a teaching title, I know that you're required to teach a class for the requirements of your title. Are there any classes that you want to teach that you don't feel quite ready to teach yet? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm developing some content on puppy gear hmm. and other gear, of course. But I've been spending a lot of time with, with some pups in the city. And all the, the hoods are, of course, as unique as the pups in them. I don't see a whole lot of focus on assisting the pups with, with caring for their gear or, or educating them about how to care for their gear. Mm. So I'm working with the current SF friendly pup and with the current SF eagle pup, Pup Savage, and the Mr. Eagle Leather, Mark, who just recently stepped down. But because all those folks are either handler or pups themselves, I'm trying to develop something with the pups in mind. So focusing sort of on, on them and their gear and, you know, how to like their tails, you know, I, I, I really want to get my hands on a tail just to kind of play with it and see what works about, you know, cleaning it. And so I'm, I'm working on that. I want to talk a little bit about your run for Northwest. I've heard about a particular client that sat for you, Miss J, the matriarch of your house. Uh. And she came in and she sat for you with a pair of moccasins. And you've talked a little bit now about kind of your indigenous heritage and House of Iron and the, the connection there. You've also kind of positioned yourself as a bit of a specialist when it comes to leather garments that are not the, quote, traditional leather uniform, right? Even what you were just talking about, about like trying to figure out stuff that's specific to puppies. I've got two questions. The, the first one is, what did it mean for you to have the matriarch of your house come and sit for you? during your run and support your run like that? What was that experience like? That was phenomenal. Miss J is is quite a presence. She has such an energy and, and you know when she's there. And if you're lucky enough to, to be in her gaze, even for a moment, it, it's, for me, it's, it's overwhelming. We had talked, Miss J and I had spoken before Northwest and she had asked me 
if I had supplies to work on suede. And in in my preparation for my title run, Little Bad Daddy, Angel Marie, and Miss V, they all got together and really rallied to help me. Mm. And I'm forever grateful. After the initial business work, if you will, they took me to Shoe Heaven, like I'm sure you know this place. I don't know. It's in the city. Baltaro. Ba- yes. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, and oh my God, that place was, I- I'm walking around cheese and the whole time and, and Miss V is just, oh, you need this. You need, and I'm just oblivious to, she was awesome. She asked me what my budget was and, and she's like, okay. And she just, and came in way under budget and was just amazing. And so she, she fully rounded out my kit for me and, as I mentioned, she was awesome with my budget. So we went over to Home Depot and, and uh, replaced my full kit to put yeah. all the business in. So Miss J had asked me, you know, did I have stuff to work on suede? And I, yes. <laughs> so I didn't understand that when she asked me that, that it was her intention to sit for me during the contestant shine portion of the contest weekend. So Friday morning, you know, f- open time for us began and uh, Miss J comes down in, in her white beaded moccasins and I'm, I'm in mine and, and Miss J's are this tall. So hers are full of, full white beaded here with, I believe, strawberries. And she sat down and it, it was, it was very overwhelming for a number of reasons. And my, my little brain was like, ah, uh, and then I thought, okay, wait, okay. What did she teach me? And I, I did the things I thought, okay, I'm good. I'm okay. Miss J trusts me, which means that she has faith in me and my ability because otherwise she wouldn't be here in these boots. And because I know that Miss J trusts me and has faith in, in what I can do and not ruin her her boots, that this is ma'am just setting the bar for me. So she's she's showing me where she wants me to be and expecting me to to rise to that level. So it was a blessing and, and quite an anxiety inducing moment all at the same time. But I, I appreciated her trust in me. So it was, it was quite an experience. (laughs) It's always special to get to do someone's gear that like is is important to you. Right. And, and in that kind of a context as well. Mm -hmm. The, the second question I have is, I'd love to know more about your approach to boot blacking types of leather that are often labeled exotic. You know, I think a lot of people get really frustrated and and don't know what to do about a suede. So what's different when it comes to caring for suede or, or leather that's been beaded? What kinds of things do you need to think about? With the suede, I've heard folks say, let me get the product. That always creates like ah, <laughs> it's like mm, what 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 do you what do you plan on putting on it? Like what what product is is always my first thought because liquid on suede will always have an after effect that there will be evidence if you p- apply liquid to suede, and so when people say product, my my first thought is like, Ooh, don't put liquid on suede. If you have to, like recently somebody said something about something got on the boot and on the suede and, and what should they do? And I said, get some, get a washcloth and, and minimal, like wring it out. So it's almost dry. That kind of wet is okay because that's, that won't create a stain sort of look. But with the beading on Miss J's boots or moccasins, the cleaning around it, of course, you have to be aware but what also comes to mind is on traditional leather boots, when I'm done, I always look over the boot for any of the little stray fray, string frays. And if a, there's a little fray to the boot, then you, I will either take a flame or I have this little, this little metal thing that heats up. And I'll take care of those little random, you know, sh- shoots of string mm-hmm. that stick out. That happened with Miss J's boot one of her boots had a piece of string and and my initial thought was to grab that little cauterizer and hit that piece of of overhang of of string but then it's like beaded 
the way beads the way beading is done, you of course sew it on. And if there's a string and you you singe that down, and if you do it too much, then you may unravel all mm -hmm. of that beading. So it's just little things like that about being aware of, of how the application process was done to the thing mm -hmm. and the understanding that, yeah, if you if you singe that one little string down, you may literally unstring all of that. I beat, so I, I have that knowledge. So sure. uh, I, I don't know if that's something that other folks would think about. And, and the other exotics, I did a pair of snake skin, I guess about seven, eight months ago. That was the first time I had done any of that of exotic leathers or exotic skins, I should say. The snake was um, crunchy. It, it was it was really bad. They they hadn't added anything done to them, and and they said in a couple of years. So when they they brought me they brought me three pairs of boots: snake skin, ostrich, and alligator. Mm. And that was the first time I had actually worked on on that sort of material before, and that that was a whole learning process. I, I did reach out to Alistair, the 2022 mm -hmm. uh, International Mr. Boot Black, and Alistair kind of guided me through steps and options about product to use. Mm -hmm. So my focus on, on the exotic sort of things has, has been a new process for me. But I, I still, you know, of course, seek, seek advice from other folks who have had more experience than me. And so I'm sure. always open to learning about things. You mentioned that you do some bead work yourself, that you do beading. I've heard that you're an artist and a craftsperson yourself. So tell me a little bit about how that intersects with, with your boot blacking and, and with kind of y your knowledge in this area. With, with my creative expression, I went to an art college. I think I mentioned until I ran out of money. I think I was, maybe I was still 17, maybe I was 18. I can't remember. But my artistic expression and my personal expression have always, I do all my own beading, I do all my own sewing, I do all my own custom to whatever it is that I want. If I cannot, if I do not have the skills to create whatever it is, then I, I outsource it. Not too long ago, a young one gifted me a abalone shell. It was Mother's Day, it was very special. Very sweet of this young person to to do that for me on Mother's Day. So I, I have this beautiful abalone shell. And now what I do as part of me and my expression and, and my leather, I use that. So instead of getting the tin lid of a saddle soap and using that, I use my abalone shell. So I, I put the soap and the water in there and I, I use a shave brush, you know, like your grandpa would use, mm -hmm. uh, Angel Marie. I love to watch boot blacks. Uh, you were talking. I love to watch another boot black, boot blacking, because, yeah, you pick up on all the little other things that that make your, for me, make my mind say, oh, well, Angel Marie was one of those. They used the, the, the little shaving brush, and I loved it. It was awesome. It covers and cleans. Anyway, so that's what I use. I, I I've started using that abalone shell just to bring a natural element into what it is that I'm up to. Of course, the br the brushes are, are mostly horse hair. So again, a natural sort of, and, and they're all made of wood. So bringing those natural elements into what it is that I'm up to is an outlet of my indigenous artistic expression. And as far as my leather, I did all this sewing. I did this sewing. If there's something that I've seen and I, I liked, I will an attempt to recreate whatever it is. So I do a lot of sewing. I put a lot of unique to me into what it is that I'm wearing. And that comes through in, in who I am as, as a person of leather, as, as an indigenous person. They're, they're very much one in the same for me now. When I ran for Northwest, I, I ran on the loud and proud because I don't see a whole lot of, like you were saying, you, you know, representation. And of course there are indigenous people who have come, came before me. Grandmother, Judy Tallwing McCarthy, she is our, our grandmother. She is very loud and proud in her indigenous. Mm -hmm. Joe Bloss, 
I met Joe when my my first sure Linda, she won the local Denver title, and then she came out here and she brought me that first year. Uh, I didn't come with her when she ran for Imsel. Hmm. She brought her boy Charlie, and Charlie actually won Im- Imsel Boot Black that year. But I don't see a whole lot of loud and proud. I don't see a lot of folks saying, yes, I'm indigenous, I'm of this tribe. I, I think that vital that I bring all of my ancestors with me when I got on that stage, not just for me. We have been historically excluded. It's not that we haven't been here. It's not that we haven't achieved. It's not that we haven't. It's that those recording history, that's very much where I'm at in in my leather journey and my indigenous journey is, is to take up space and and be here and represent because I do hope to to pave the way for others to to you know step behind me or or continue with me I love that like you know you mentioned that it was kind of the house of iron and and meeting Miss J that kind of helped bring some of that back in and helped kind of connect the two and that kind of close connection that really made the difference in helping you get to that place of being more proud? Miss J is loud and proud in her indigenous. And having an example of both those things and seeing her navigate in the world and having her, I guess just her presence as an indigenous woman and making it through life and having the confidence that she does and the fire that she does is is very inspiring and and when she smiles at me and and again I, I think it goes back to that whole I know she's proud of me and that makes me feel really good. So of course that's that's what I want to continue. So I think being supported in my indigenous and my indigenous expression from Miss J specifically. It has made a huge impact uh, in who I am and what I am willing to accept and not accept. But it also, I do think that, that my first sir, that Linda, that the way sir, I guess, molded me or, you know, started my foundation of who I am. Sir and I never played in a top-bottom way. Our exchange was always at one of an equal energy. So that equal energy sort of beginning and then Miss J's sort of affirming has allowed me to use my voice. Before that was not something that I was real comfortable with. I was very quiet, very shy, very in the background. And and having folks remind me, you know, that I am worthy and, and I am valued has truly helped. So, yeah, it's been a lot. And I've, I'm, again, thankful and gratitude are, are often thoughts in my brain. Uh, Miss J's influence has definitely helped with my indigenous. So it, it's it's been quite a ride. It, it truly has. And I, I'm thankful for, for the time and effort and energy and knowledge that she shares with me. So, I'd like to try to take a step back from the very personal conversation we've been having, which I, I think has been really wonderful. The leather community, uh, historically, has appropriated a lot of language and a lot of ritual, I think, from indigenous culture. And many well-respected people in the leather community continue to use words like tribe to refer to a gathering of leather people. You know, and and I know that Miss J has has posted on on social media a bit about hook pulls and and that ritual and and the way that has been appropriated from indigenous culture there's been a lot of tension in some of those conversations and i think in part because people in the leather community have a lot of deep respect for fakir and fakir is at least in part responsible for a lot of people you know in the leather community being kind of exposed to this and the quote-unquote modern primitive you know attitude it strikes me that you've kind of had this unique experience of like having indigenous heritage, not being connected to it a lot of your life, coming into leather and then reconnecting with that heritage. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, if or how that background has kind of impacted your experience of 
the community and of that appropriation. It's it's a weird situation specifically with with Fikir. I know that there have been conversations about the appropriation of the hook pulls and 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 it's it's odd to think that non-indigenous people feel they have a right and come at the oh but I'm doing it res- with res- the utmost respect. I'm doing it in a in a way that's honoring indigenous people and and saying all the things and then holding the classes and and taking the money but I'm doing it respectfully so that mentality is hard to grasp with is 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 a hard grasp it's it's just difficult because it's like part of for me personally part of me wants to make an effort and have a conversation but then the other part of me thinks you're so much in your own privilege that a conversation about what you've appropriated, what you're continuing to do is so inappropriate. There's no indigenous input into what he's doing. Uh, from my understanding, there's no financial compensation. There's no offering to to those folks that he's he's honoring and, and paying the utmost respect to. Um so to do both, to hold the ho- the hook pulls and collect money for doing the hook pulls, I don't really see the point in trying to have a conversation with somebody when they're clearly set in their own privilege of doing what they're doing. And I honestly don't believe that Indigenous folks saying, hey, this isn't right, that it would make any difference. And, and that's unfortunate. I, I would like to think that I do like to think that there's always a chance to to help educate somebody who's appropriated an indigenous person's culture. If if they're alive, then there's an opportunity, there's a chance that that person will hear and grow and change their behavior. I don't think that's I don't think that's the case, uh, and and that's sad because you know we're all people and. We all we're here and and we should be respectful of each other, and I just don't think that that appropriation and that I I think what what I find the, the most offensive is just the the financial gain that that's going mm. on behind it. It it's bad enough that it was appropriated, but it's even worse that the the financial situation. I think what what strikes me too about you know what you just said. You know, Fakir died in in 2018, but there are people that are that learned from him and that are practicing this mm-hmm. and leading things. There are organizations that are doing this and yeah. and collecting money to do it. But but what really you know strikes me is <laughs> the way in which um, they position themselves as the arbiters of whether or not they are being respectful or not. Um, you know, the, the way you phrase that, right. That they will say, I'm doing it respectfully yeah. when like that, they're not really the ones that are determining whether or not they're doing it respectfully, yeah. like for them to decide and say, I'm doing this respectfully is once again, in and of itself, like removing the voice from people who disagree, right. Rather than letting the people who have been harmed speak for themselves and say, actually, no, this isn't a practice I'm okay with, right? Yeah. Dominant cultures like to position themselves as the arbiter of what is right and wrong. You know, the, the leather community is often a microcosm of what's going on in the rest of the world. And I'm wondering if, you know, you, you can speak to any of the kind of larger movements happening in the world and the ways that communities are trying to evolve their thinking you know, with regards to things like land acknowledgments and land taxes, and you know, I know there was a a, a land acknowledgement tonight, but I, I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on that because I know lots of people disagree, and and people certainly with uh, people with indigenous heritage are not a monolith, right? And so, I don't know. I would just love to hear your thoughts. As far as with the land acknowledgments, that does also create that that sort of duel for me. I appreciate that that there is the acknowledgement that we are all we are all on stolen land. I I get that folks are trying to soften that blow if you will. But the kick is that's all that's being done. Mm-hmm. It's thoughts and prayers and here you go. 
no, there needs to be, no, put, put, put your boots down, mm. you know, get your hands dirty. But I also learned this evening, which I thought was really cool as far as a positive step forward. Somebody mentioned five states, including this state, have an amber alert for indigenous women. Mm. They couldn't remember what the color was, but there's a specific color that when the alert goes out, it this color means it's an, a missing indigenous woman or girl. Mm. And I, I believe that person mentioned it. it's five states now that, that do that. And mm. that's words in action. If the land acknowledgments continue, then hopefully that will put those words into more action. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the positive side, I guess, of, of land acknowledgments is they've started to raise some awareness, mm -hmm. right? And awareness mm -hmm. is really the first step yeah. towards action. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I think there are a lot of people who are not aware, right? And, and they should be because, <laughs> you know, we studied U.S. history, <laughs> but people don't think right? People don't think about the implications of things. Um, what you just mentioned around the, the Amber Alert is, is kind of a, a perfect transition to my last question. In June of 2022, police in Winnipeg, Manitoba, recovered body parts, which would later be identified as belonging to Rebecca Contois, I think is how you pronounce her last name. I, I, and not good at French, <laughs> at the Brady Road landfill. Rebecca is believed to be a victim of a serial killer who's been targeting Indigenous women in Canada. They think that the person who is responsible has been responsible for at least four deaths in, in that area. Can you tell me a little bit about Camp Morgan? So I've, I've, my title year has been a little crazy. Sure. So I've been a little busy. And, and due to that, I, I have not been as active in, in our house sort of conversations about our efforts. From my understanding of what's going on, uh, the folks at, at the Camp Morgan are pushing the Canadian government, the Canadian authorities, to search the landfills. We, of course, want to find these women and we want to bring them home. We need to find if there are more than the four that, that are being credited to this serial killer. It's shameful that the, the Canadian government knows and is still choosing not to do anything in a real proactive way to, to get that accomplished. So the Camp Morgan folks are spearheading that effort and we're supporting Camp Morgan and what they're trying to accomplish there. So we are raising money to help get that accomplished. These women need to be brought home. The government has admitted that they think there are more bodies in the landfills, but uh -huh. they are refusing to search them. Yes. Um, which is, is pretty despicable. And so House of Iron is doing a, like a virtual boot black thing, some, some education, some it, classes. I, I think it's broken, broken sh snowshoe moon. Yeah. Um, and House of Iron in general is is involved in you're in invo involved in fundraising efforts. Yes, thank you. The broken sh snowshoe. <laughs> Do you have any other you know th things that you've been doing, or uh, maybe some advice to people who are maybe listening who want to help support this effort and to to try to find these missing women and and bring them home? I know there are financial links to Camp Morgan that you can donate directly. As far as what we as the house are doing, I, I know that there is a couple of different shirt options. I believe there's an Etsy for that. So all of the things that the house, there are efforts that the house are making to, to assist with that, but I know that the camp itself does have a, a financial link for donations directly. So there's I, a way to donate directly and, and your house is of course doing the, the boot black fundraiser. You know, it, it's a great opportunity for people to kind of put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. And, and kind of get involved. Right. Awesome. And I, I don't know if there's any effort to kind of push the Canadian government. It seems to me that reaching out to the Canadian government directly would also be a, a beneficial way to to put some energy uh, not all folks are able to to financially contribute so sure. um that that was my other thought 
there are probably letter writing campaigns or, yes. or various uh, things that, that people can get involved yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking some time this evening and, and just chatting. It was it was fun getting to know you a little bit and, and hearing a little bit more of your story and, and all of the things that you're doing. Thank you. It's a pleasure.